The views and opinions expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of Open Sky Radio. Please be advised. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the fire you can't put out with you as usual. My name is Melvin, and I want to thank you for joining me today. We are taping episode forty-three of TFYCPO. On November the 15th, just to give you some idea of where we are at politically. It's been a mad interesting week in the news, and my goodness, I can't wait to get to every single bit of it. First of all, I want to start a little bit off script by saying a couple things about Obamacare. Um, Obviously, there are still some issues with the website. We'll get to that in a minute. And with those problems with the website, the president gave a press conference where he mentioned the other day that he is going to hold off or he's pushing for Congress to pass a bill where they'll hold off for one more year with respect to the minimums in Obamacare. Now, we covered those minimums last week and the the insurance companies have had three years to get ready for those minimums. And there were certain things you – you know, you, you you have to cover hospital stays and all these other things. Um, and the insurance companies decided not to do that. And instead, what they decided to do, and coming up on the first of next year, which is when everybody's policy starts again, they decided to go ahead and just write to people and tell them that, well, their their policies are now canceled. But if they want, they can pay 10 times more and get these new policies with the same benefits. What they didn't tell them was that if they went to healthcare.gov, or simply call the 800 number that was set up by the White House, then they'd be able to sign up for a better plan for less money. So they've been dropping people left and right. But the president did say numerous times, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. And all those substandard plans began crashing around people. And no, they did not go to healthcare.gov. So the president said, well, promise is a promise. Fine. One more year. You can keep your substandard plans. He sent that. He sent he, and of course he can't do that himself. Much as people think the president does everything solo, he can't do it by himself. He can say that he's the president. He can set the agenda, but he can't simply make it so. So he sends it off to Congress, and of course the first bill that Congress sends over completely defunds Obamacare. So it's probably not going to happen. Uh, the numbers came out for the first month. And we were somewhere in the low hundred thousands with respect to the people that have signed up to this point. So 48 million people in the country without health care coverage. Okay, we're getting there. We're not there yet, but we're definitely getting there. Uh, And then uh, so there's there's signing up by and large, obviously, um, through through the through the phone number. Um, This just came out just a just a little bit ago today, just a couple of minutes ago. Found this over on Daily Coast, uh, and it, it's been widely reported. This specifically, though, comes from The Hill. A key official in the repair effort for healthcare.gov said the site's error rate is now lower than 1% thanks to weeks worth of special improvements that were made. Former White House Budget Director Jeff Zients, who was enlisted to triage the website, Touted the development as a sign of progress. Yeah, I'm going to say less than 1%. That is a fabulous sign of progress. He noted that there were no unscheduled outages on the site in this past week, a positive sign, uh, and that more than 60 bugs were recently fixed. Um, Mitt Romney was on with David Gregory uh, last week. And, of course, they bring out Mitt Romney because all of this is uh, based off of Romney care. And he says, Mitt Romney, what could President Obama have done that would have been better than what he did do? And, of course, Mitt Romney, without skipping a beat, says, well, first of all, you have to set up health care exchanges. Okay, and those exchanges have to be state by state. He also noted that, okay, and by the way, (laughs) okay, the president did set up state exchanges. And they varied state by state. Okay. And he said, you can't do this everywhere. This was the Massachusetts plan. Actually, when you implemented that in Massachusetts, you said this should be the plan for the entire country. Fine. There's a reason why you are irrelevant. With all the problems that Obamacare has had, I really think that a couple years from now, we're going to look back 
and we're going to call these the dark days, the bad old days. Remember way back when, because see, when Romneycare was implemented in Massachusetts, I think after the first month they had maybe a 100 people signed up. So they say, well, only 100,000 plus people have signed up for Obamacare, um, and there's 40-some million people that are without insurance. Okay, well, we're ahead of Romneycare so far, and Romneycare turned out to be a rousing success, and it is still in place to this day. Romney's not allowed to own up to it, though. All right, on to the next thing. There is a vigorous debate going on right now, mostly in the House of Representatives. Why? Because, well, the House of Representatives is run by Republicans. Over in the Senate, they got this on lock. Those are your Democrats. Uh, it's about the minimum wage. They want to raise the federal minimum wage to 1010. Now, there's been talk about this for a while, but obviously after what happened in SeaTac, raising it to $15 an hour, it has lit a fire underneath their pantalones. So there's a lot of lies that have been going around for some time about the minimum wage. All the terrible, terrible, awful things that it's going to do. I would like to dispel a few of those rumors and then say, hey, 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 to my brothers and sisters, it is time to raise the minimum wage. So, the first lie, raising the minimum wage will cost jobs. This comes to us, by the way, uh, Greg Miller over at AddictingInfo.org, written early last month, a fantastic article if you want to go and read the whole thing. I'm going to give you snippets. Raising the minimum wage will cost jobs. This is the biggest lie. Several studies have shown that increasing the minimum wage reduces turnover, increases spending, and increases demands. These studies have all come to the conclusion that raising the minimum wage has a negligible effect one way or the other on job creation. Does giving an increase really cost jobs? No, it seems that the real problem is that it affects profit margins. Line number two, raising the minimum wage only helps young workers. Categorically false. The majority of minimum wage workers are, in fact, 20 years of age or older. 76%, to quote CNN Money, who took their statistics from the Department of Labor and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Sadly, almost two-thirds of the adults are working for minimum wage, and they are women. 41% of all minimum wage workers are college-educated to some degree, many of these with college debt. Okay, raising the minimum wage will hurt small business. This one comes up a lot, and I like to point out, I used to work for a small businessman. Yeah, I was paid a fair living wage, in my opinion. And that's always been the case with me. Any business that is running so close to being unprofitable that an increase in the, minim the, the, uh, uh, increase in the minimum wage would cause them to go bankrupt, that business is failing as a venture. Okay, think about that. If you can't pay a living wage, if you have to pay your employees slave wages in order for you to stay profitable, raise your prices, man. You can't, you can't do that. You can't demand somebody's time and energy and then say that, well, you're going to live in poverty. By the way, if I may interject really quickly, the entire idea with the minimum wage, of course, was this is the level that we will set so that you will not be we're the working poor, so to speak. Okay, so set the minimum wage. Anyone working, making less than that, would be in poverty. Anybody making that or above would be at or above poverty, right? Or ideally above. But with what the minimum wage has done is it stayed stagnant, completely low. Quite honestly, in my opinion, it should be. And I'm not an ec ec I'm not an economist, but I think that it should easily easily be at least at least fifteen dollars an hour okay when i started working back in 1996 i was making four and a quarter an hour i think that was actually minimum wage it might have been 450 anyways i started out at four and a quarter an hour oh god 17 years ago okay so it is 750 right now the federal minimum wage but a lot of states opt out of that and keep it even lower than that and of course if you work for tips there's plenty of states that only pay you two thirteen an hour. Okay, so increasing the minimum wage. Okay, when polled over of the over the effects of raising the minimum wage, two thirds of small business owners said increasing the minimum wage will help the economy because the people with the lowest income are the most likely to spend any pay increases buying necessities that they could not afford before. 
which will boost sales at businesses. This will increase the customer demand that businesses need to retain or hire new employees. Think about that. We that make the money, right, the ones that are not rich, if you, you give a rich guy a, a wad of money, he's going to throw it on the pile or send it offshore. I've said this before. You give money to somebody like me or some other folks that I know, they're going to run out and spend it. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been lied to. The wealthy are not the job creators. You and I are the job creators. Raising the minimum wage will hurt the economy. My, my, my. Raising the minimum wage will actually help the economy. More people with more liquid income spend more. It's really just that simple. The rising tide lifts all boats. Does increasing the minimum wage increase unemployment? 60 years of data says no. Raise the minimum wage. This polls crazy good with people, no matter what party they're from. With the Democrats, it's like 90 some percent. With, with, with moderates or independents, it's somewhere in the 80s. With Republicans, with Republicans, it's like 76 percent want the minimum ra- wage raised. Hey, if you work full time, you should not have to be poor. So, where does your money go? There's been quite a bit of, there more and more debate coming up lately about welfare. And I don't particularly understand the debate. Because the conservatives are always saying things like, well, I saw somebody, you know, using one of those welfare debit cards and then they drove home in their Escalade with their gold watch and all this, you know, I saw this really, really wealthy person, well, with, you know, getting food stamps or whatever the hell. If you make 50 grand a year, and I'm just using that as the, for the sake of argument, if you make 50 grand a year, you're paying between, I'd say, 36 and $40 a year for somebody to go on food stamps. Now, remember, TNAF was reformed. I hate to call it that, but that's what happened. It was reformed in 1996, and, and that ended the whole idea of generational welfare. The benefits for for assistance have been falling precipitously since 1996, and it's actually been pushing more people into poverty. That said, if you make between 50 and 60 grand a year, or 50 a year, 50 grand a year, excuse me, you're paying about 36 to 40 bucks for for money to to go into the into the treasury where it will be doled out as welfare. You want to know what you're paying for corporate welfare? The one thing that you're not pissing and moaning about six grand oh yeah six thousand dollars he ain't thirty six dollars is bad the big the big businesses that don't want to pay their taxes are costing you six grand a year whitehouse.gov slash tax calculator 2012 there's not one up for 2013 because taxes haven't been paid yet this however comes from commondreams.org paul buckite over there laid this out now if you go to the tax t- calculator on whitehouse.gov, you'll see that what they have listed there is that most of your money goes to defense. A, a gigantic chunk of the money you pay every, every every year goes to just straight to defense. If I may say, I don't think we're any safer. But what they pointed out, what Paul over at Common Dreams points out, is the things that are not listed inside that tax, tax calculator. $870 for direct subsidies and grants to companies. The Cato Institute estimates that the U.S. federal government spends $100 billion a year on corporate welfare. That's an average of $870 for each of one of Americans' 115 million families. $696 for business incentives at the state, county, and city level. The subsidies mentioned above are federal subsidies. A New York Times investigation found that these states, counties, and cities give up to or up over $80 billion each year to companies. That's $696 for every U.S. family. $722 for interest rate subsidies for banks. The same nitwits that crashed our economy. Oh, yeah. 
According to the Huffington Post, the U.S. government essentially gives the banks three cents of every tax dollar. They cite research that calculates a nearly 1% benefit to banks when they borrow through bonds and customer deposits and other liabilities. This amounts to taxpayer subsidy of $83 billion or $722 for every family. And this is going to J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, by and large. $350 for retirement fund bank fees. The economic... Policy Institute notes that the average middle quintile family is a, 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 a retirement account is about $34,000. A conservative 1% annual management fee translates to about three hundred fifty dollars per family. That, again, is an average. Many families have no retirement accounts, so some families pay even more. $1,268 for overpriced medicine. You may or may not remember, but the Bush administration, and by the way, the president doesn't pass the bill his Congress does. They passed a bill saying that you cannot, that, that hospitals cannot negotiate anymore for lower drug prices. So here we go. According to Dean Baker, government granted patent monopolies raised the price of prescription drugs by close to $270 billion a year compared to the free market price. This represents an astonishing cost of over $2,000 to the average American family or Translate it down to $1,268 per household. Now remember, the, what we're talking about here is at the 50 grand level. So if you're higher or lower, of course you adjust accordingly. $870 for corporate tax subsidies. The Tax Foundation has concluded that their special tax provisions cost taxpayers over $100 billion a year. $1,231 uh, $1, for revenue losses from corporate tax havens. The guys that don't want to pay their taxes, guess what? You're picking up their bill. $36 or $6,000. Overall, American families are paying an annual $6,000 subsidies to, cut to, comp to corporations that have doubled their profits and cut their taxes in half while cutting 2.9 million jobs and adding almost as many jobs Overseas, the libertarian paradise, an alarming number of people are starting to call themselves libertarians. And if you're a libertarian, you would be against this, which I just talked about. But many libertarians are kind of lining up with the Republicans and more and more. See, the big the biggest difference between the Republicans in, in the in the libertarians is the Republicans will say, well, screw everybody who's not us. And the libertarians will say, screw everybody, including us. Zero government, period, whatsoever. So what What about police, fire, bridges? Well, they all become tolls. Really, a story from the libertarian paradise. Justin and Casey Parcells' home went up in flames on the night of August 12th. Uh, they were staying at a relative's house preparing for the birth of a child and were not home at the time. A neighbor notified them of the blaze and they made the 45-minute drive home. But by that time, the fire was completely out and their home was destroyed. Two weeks later, on August 27th, they got a bill from the retro, or excuse me, rural metro fire department for $20,000. The bill included charges of $1,500 per fire truck and $100, $150 an hour per firefighter and insurance has said that they won't pay the bill. What are they being accused of? They're being accused of not paying their local firefighter bill. Now, there's a fire department there in town, uh, a local volunteer fire department, but that fire department was out of reach, so the private one was sent out. And the private one put out their house and charged them $20,000 for it. So now they've got a child on the way, they have no place to live, and they're being charged $20,000. Contacted by Huffington Post on Monday, Colin Williams, the public information officer for Rural Metro, said the bill is justified. Hey, he says they didn't pay their bill. They say that they're not, they weren't even aware of the bill. According to Fox 10 News in Arizona, people living in the Purcells neighborhood were clueless about the rural metro subscription plan until after the Purcells fire, and now they can't wait to pay it. So that's the world you'll live in. Every bridge, a toll bridge, when you get pulled over by a police officer, you'll get a bill in the mail. Your house burns to the ground, you have no house. And you have a gigantic bill. And the other thing about taking the commons, and I believe that healthcare is a common, taking the commons 
and privatizing them makes them more expensive and less efficient. There are jobs for government, and there are not jobs for government. I believe that the commons, the things that we all share, those are jobs for government, and we can run those at a relatively low overhead. Other things, fine. Manufacturing, cars, clothing, fine. Go, go, go. Keep all those things private. The libertarians would disagree. They'd say everything should be privatized because once it's done for profit, it's done for the best reason. I digress. The LAX shooter. We didn't talk much about this. Um, I'm a little guilty here because the LAX shooter, with as common as shootings have become, I... I've been I've been pulling back on them a little bit because I I only have an hour a week that I get to spend with you folks or I limit myself to an hour because I want the show to stay nice and tight and listenable. But the shootings are pretty outrageous and they're happening more and more. This one was this one was particularly interesting though, but I wanted to wait for more things to come out about it. Okay, now on Friday, November first, twenty twenty thirteen, okay, so just a couple weeks ago. 23-year-old Paul Anthony Ciencia opened fire with a two, uh, uh, two, 223 caliber assault rifle, shooting and killing TSA officer Geraldo Hernandez at point-blank range just days before his 40th birthday. He wounded several people but only killed Hernandez. After killing Hernandez, he continued walking and shooting. Witnesses say he went from person to person asking, Are you TSA? Southern Poverty Law Center nailed it with respect to who this gentleman is. Because after all these tragedies happen, there's always the discussion, was he a registered Democrat? Was he a registered Republican? Was he a registered... Well, this guy was not registered as anything, depending on who you believe. But I'll point out real quick that he's a teabagger. Southern Poverty Law Center. Ciencia's language and references seem to put him squarely in the conspiracy-minded world of the anti-government patriot movement the new world order refers to a long-standing conspiracy theory that today in its most popular iteration claims that the global elites are plotting to form a socialistic one world government that would crush american freedoms often the root of the alleged conspiracy is traced to the 1913 creation of the federal reserve and adoption of fiat currency paper money that is not backed by gold as it once was in the u.s those descriptions pretty clearly put him in the Tea Party. But the free patriots say, no, 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 we've uncovered the dirt. They paid the money. They found out that he's a registered Democrat. Listen, in his manifesto, that among other things, he called NSA Director Janet Napolitano, forgive my language here, he called her a bull dyke. Statements were found expressing his hatred for blacks, homosexuals, and the NSA and their affiliate, the TSA. He also clearly expressed his concern about, wait for it, the New World Order and the plot that's been going on since 1917 to force socialism on the world. That, ladies and gentlemen, is clearly, clearly a teabagger. I know it shouldn't matter, but these folks are dangerous. And all of, if to express an opinion... Okay, for me to get on this mic, for Hannity or Limbaugh or anyone else to get on the microphone and, and understand that this, this is the way we are communicating with the world. It's blatantly, flatly irresponsible to say things that could drive another person to do things like that. See, my hope is that me getting on this mic inspires you to open a book. You know, start reading news or stories or just anything, right? But if all you're doing is is maybe driving along and listening, you're having me on in the background and just taking what I what I what I what I'm saying as the gospel. I, I give sources because I want you to look these things up. I, I'm trying I'm trying to inform folks here. And over on Right Wing Radio, they give you this is what it is. This is what they're doing. Go, even though they don't explicitly tell you go. More and more teabaggers are just popping up and killing people. It's, <laughs> once again, I digress. <laughs> uh, let us get into Ted Cruz's dad. The reason I want to get into this is because uh, Ted Cruz, who unfortunately has five years left, I don't know how we're all going to survive it, 
Uh, his dad has been making more and more headlines as of late, as of late, because Ted Cruz's dad believes that Ted Cruz is going to help bring about the apocalypse, and he's so happy that Ted Cruz is now a sitting U.S. senator. Uh, he gave a speech recently uh, at the OK2A, which is an anti-government 912 uh, project uh, uh, summit. Okay, uh, 912 is the Glenn Beck group, and he said, "You know, the Bible's clear." Go to Genesis chapter 9 and you will find that the death penalty, clear, death penalty is clearly stated in Genesis chapter 9. God ordains the death penalty. On the subject of mass shootings on school campuses, uh, Rafael Cruz, which is what his name is, blamed Democrats who have lobbied for gun control in response to the atrocities. Look at all the massacres that we've had in the last year or two. The left is trying to use to tell us that we don't need guns. Every one of those people that was killed was in a gun-free zone. All the while, amens and exactly is coming out of the audience. Pro-death. Yes, yes. You want to eliminate school massacres? Have the teachers carry guns, he says. How stupid can you be? I love being talked talk down to. <laughs> Cruz also spoke at length against same-sex marriage, arguing it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. What an original thought. More broadly, the senator's father warned that social justice quickly leads to socialism and ultimately communism. Cruz attacked President Obama as a king and a tyrant before closing with, bless you all. Raphael, thank you for blessing me. He wasn't done. Oh no, he went on. Uh, out, he went to a, a Freedom Works grassroots summit, okay, and note, and, and was talking about a previous speaker and met, who had mentioned something about Hispanics being uninformed and deceived. And Raphael, not missing a beat, said, that's also true of the black population. That's right. He's saying the black population is also uninformed and deceived. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if we could communicate the truth, and I'm quoting here, if we could communicate the truth... Not only to the Hispanics, but to the black population, all blacks would be Republican. Ladies and gentlemen, put that on a t-shirt. Just see what happens. <laughs> Highly religious, strongly pro-family, strongly pro-life values, and high military enrollment rates align Hispanics' principles with the Republican parties. Exit polls from the 2012 election, however, indicate that a majority of Latino voters, 59%, supported same-sex marriage, while an even larger majority, 66%, supported abortion rights, and 52% of African Americans supported same-sex marriage. He went on. Let's talk about the black population. All the civil rights that African Americans have obtained have come from the Republicans. But do you know who took credit? The Democrats. Whew. It makes me feel all dirty. <laughs> this kind of hate language, which is regularly making appearances all over the place, up to and including our own Congress, well, it's 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 getting it's getting to be less, and it's eventually going to come to an end. Uh, let's talk about end a little bit. Uh, gay rights. Now, this comes to us from Carrie Elevate over at Salon.com. Gay rights a, are currently a winning issue for Democrats and a losing one for the GOP. Take note of that. Majority. Leader Harry Reid asserted that the GOP-controlled House of Representatives was going to have to capitulate if they have any hope of nominating a viable candidate for president or if they want to hang on to the House. Apparently, the GOP, GOP firebrands agree. When it came time for Senate Republicans to voice their objections to the bill before the procedural vote on Monday, none of them stood up. You know why? Because nearly 70% of Americans and uh, support the bill, and 90% believe that the bill already exists. Now, remember, ENDA is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. It means you cannot fire people for being gay. On the House side, an aide for Speaker John Boner... Boehner, fine, strenuously objected when the Huff, when Huff Poe reported Monday that Boehner's stated opposition to the Employment Non-Discrimination Act dealt a blow to the bill's chances of reaching the president's desk, and partly because Washington was finally has finally caught on to the fact that being pro-LGBT just isn't about winning over gay voters and donors. The times, they are a-changing, Chuck Schumer said earlier this week. If you want to alienate young voters, opposing ENDA is a good way to do that. Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa called on Boehner to bring the bill to the floor, saying, I'm convinced if the House votes on this, it will pass and go to the president for his signature. Schumer piled on even further. Everyone talks about gridlock in Washington, and it rests with one man. Speaker Boehner. 
Bring it up, because it will pass. Speaking of which, it passed again this week. The, the Hawaii Senate passed uh, a House amended bill legalizing same-sex marriage on Tuesday, November 12th, 2013. Uh, even though Illinois passed it last week, Quickly after it was passed in Hawaii this week, they've already signed it into law. Now, Illinois is going to sign it into law also, okay? Ceremonies will begin in the Aloha State on December 2nd. Now, it, it, there, was, there was plenty of opposition to the bill even still, so obviously there's still some work to be done. There are still some people that have to be bought in. But look, look at how fast this is happening, okay? Think about... Think about just one year ago, only six states and the District of Columbia recognized same-sex marriage. Today, that number has more than doubled. 14 states and the District of Columbia currently allow same-sex marriage, with Hawaii and Illinois poised to become the 15th and 16th states, respectively. Hawaii, even though going second, is now 15, and Illinois will soon be 16. Let me, excuse me, let me get into uh, Obamacare again. Uh, Medicaid enrollments are far outpacing new insurance numbers under Obamacare. So far, a subtle sign that the program could play a greater role in the law's coverage expansion than first anticipated. Some people are signing up for the Medicaid expansion created by the president's new health care law. This comes from uh, Daily Coast uh, by Joan McCarter. In Washington State, our beautiful state right here, uh, for instance, the overwhelming number of people signing up for health coverage are eligible for Medicaid. State figures show... Of the 35,528 state residents who had signed up in the first three weeks of enrollment, 55% were part of the Medicaid expansion population and 32% were eligible for the state's existing Medicaid program. Only 13% signed up for a new private insurance plan. In Kentucky, where they've got Connect, another state running its own exchange, 26,174 people had enrolled in new coverage as of Thursday. Four out of five had enrolled in Medicaid. Here's the thing. Even if they got their wish and overturned Obamacare right now, all the positive things that have happened so far, those things are not going away. The Medicaid expansion is not going away. The people who have already signed up for these plans with these private for-profit insurance companies that are now charging them a lower rate rather than these exorbitant rates through the state exchanges, those things are here to stay. The the Republicans, obviously, with what the president said earlier this week about letting people keep their 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 worthless plans for another year, they're trying to defund Obamacare. I don't think they're going to do it, but bless their hearts for trying. It's not going to happen. But even if it did, all the positive things that have taken place so far, those things will continue. We've only got maybe another 10 years of uh, in America, in my opinion, where we have insurance companies – that where your primary insurance comes from a private for-profit health insurance company, I believe within 10 years, we will have, mark my words, what is today? So 2013, November 15th, fine. 10 years. So definitely in time for me to become an old man, we will have universal health care. We're the last country in the world to not do it. We're the only one where we allow private for-profit companies to... To, to sell you your primary insurance. Eventually, we'll all be under the same beautiful umbrella. I'm painting a, painting a great picture here, ain't I? We'll be under the same umbrella, and only, only the really high-end plans will be for sale. <clears throat> the oldest profession, staying with Obamacare here, the oldest profession is soon to have health insurance. Thanks, Obama. Obamacare will finally, oh, but this comes from this, uh, Andrea Fleming over at liberalamerica.org. Obamacare will be able to finally make healthcare affordable to workers in the oldest profession. You know what I'm talking about with many of them qualifying for the tax credit. That means, yes, uh, tax dollars, including John Boehner's and Ted Cruz's, will be going towards supplementing the cost of their healthcare. That includes ladies and gentlemen. Of the night. Now there, not only are these workers going to be healthier, they're also organizing for the betterment of the group. Susie, Susie Q, age 28, an, uh, an adult worker, planned an event called the Healthy Hoes Party, in which attendees, also workers in the industry, were encouraged to enroll in the Obamacare exchanges. Out of almost 40% at the hoedown, nearly all completed the enrollment paperwork. They, 
uh, look at themselves as any other small business and they do not have the benefit of employer coverage. Susie uh, and her partner have tried to purchase insurance in the past, but after being quoted everything from four to $500, they knew it was something that their budget just wouldn't allow. Now with the ACA in place as of January 1st next year, uh, she and her partner will be able to get health care for around the same price. But with a tax credit of approximately $275 a month, they will only end up paying about $175 out of pocket. Yes, these are the beautiful stories that are coming out of this. You're, well, hey, you may not like the ladies and gentlemen of the night, but trust me, if they're covered, uh, they're being safer, they're spreading less disease, quite honestly, anytime anyone's better, anyone's healthier, we all benefit. You may not feel it directly, but we all benefit. Bless your hearts, ladies and gentlemen of the night, even though I wouldn't pay for any of you. Hey, you understand, okay? But bless your hearts. Go, go, do your thing, okay? Um, I want to get into the shutdown just a little bit, and then I want to move into my weird news and then my DMs. Um, the 2013 shutdown, okay? And before we shut down recently, the last time we had shut down, once again, because the Republicans wanted to shut us down, was 96, so quite a long time ago. Um, but every time there's a shutdown, because it doesn't happen every year, it's only when there's a Democratic president, and it's only when the Republicans want to shut it down. So the president, and he seems wounded right now with what's going on with, Ob- with Obamacare, but it's 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 getting better, okay? Um, I think he needs to start honing his message now for 2014, because, hey, as soon as Christmas happens, or as soon as New Year's happens, and that calendar flips, you're going to see ads everywhere. I think the president needs to hammer on this. This comes to us uh, from William Sailton over at Salon.com. How to make it, the shutdown, the 2013 shutdown, a political weapon. The economic excuse. Obama noted that before the shutdown, the economy was recovering and the deficit was falling. The fiscal standoff changed that. Almost every analyst out there believes it slowed our growth. Even the threat of defaults to the president increased our borrowing costs, which adds to the deficit. Okay, The Republican downgrade. Two years ago, when S&P downgraded the government's credit rating, it cited high deficits as well as the 2011 debt ceiling standoff. Ever since, Republicans have argued that the deficits, not the standoff, caused the downgrade. This time, we haven't been downgraded, but we've been put on credit watch by Fitch. Okay, These are all things you can use. Now, I'm sure the president's not listening to my show, but you never know. National security. I should just send him the article. National security. Even after killing Osama bin Laden, Obama is constantly accused of weakness. On October 17th, Obama reported that U.S. diplomats have been hearing from their counterparts internationally. Some of the folks who pushed for the shutdown and threatened to fall claim their actions were needed to get America back on the right track to make sure we're strong. But probably nothing has been done more to damage America's credibility, credibility in the world. Think about that. We really really want to fight terrorism, we really want to look good to the terrorists, we really don't want to make the terrorists happy, we need to look united as a country. We don't need to look like we are our own worst enemy. And with what happened with the shutdown, that's exactly what happened. We have never looked weak. You say, oh, it's all Obama's fault. Obama can't shut down the government. You know who can and did? Need I say more? Yes. <laughs> the value of government. Number four, what happened in 95 and 96 has happened again. Closing the government has made Americans miss it from Obama. One of the things that I hope all of us have learned these past few weeks is that it turns out that smart, effective government is important. It matters. I think the American people during the shutdown had a chance to get some idea of the things large and small the government does that make a difference in people's lives. You know, we all hear the same about how government's the problem. Well, it turns out we rely on it in a whole lot of ways. So let's work together, make work together, make government better instead of treating it like the enemy. Go, President Obama, go! All right, falling Bibles, here they come. I know, terrible segue, right? <laughs> Follow me. Uh, this comes to us from FoxNews.com. You heard that right? A Colorado-based Christian group is dro- airdropping Bibles on North Korea. That sounds helpful. Over the past year, Pastor Eric Foley and his Christian mission group, Seoul USA, have released around 50,000 40-foot homemade hydrogen balloons outfitted with Bibles and personal testimonials over rural areas of the country. Bibles 
are attached to the balloons in a box or a bag. In North Korea, citizens are forced to follow the state ideology known as the Jush idea, uh, J-U-C-H-E. Uh, Christians there are the most persecuted believers in the world, Foley told Fox. He estimates that there is around 100,000 Christians in the country. The network reports that 30,000 of those Christians are believed to be locked inside concentration camps where they are overworked, starved, tortured, and killed. In 2009, a 33-year-old woman was publicly executed in North Korea after being accused of distributing the Bible. Kenneth Bay, an American missionary, was arrested in North Korea and sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for crimes against the state in May. So they are airdropping Bibles on them. That sounds safe, but good for them. Airdropping Bibles, my, my, my. You know, you know what I bet they, they would much rather have? Uh, I'm not, not going to get into it. <laughs> All right, so let's get into our DMs. Let us start with Representative Ron Dwyer, who pleaded guilty uh, just a little while ago to operating a boat while drunk. The crash resulted from the debacle, resulted in injuries for seven people, including a five-year-old girl. name of the boat was the legislator, by the way. Okay, Now he's making headlines again, only this time he was operating a boat while in... Uh, excuse me. No, excuse me. No, no, sorry. Sorry, hold on a second. That, no, that was his. That was his boat. Okay. No, now he's operated a car. Now he's operated a car, uh, and he was pulled over because the tags were expired. Okay. Uh, no one was hurt this time. Dwyer was stopped on Route 100 at about 12:45 a.m. in the morning due to his erratic driving, and according to the police report, he appeared glassy-eyed with slurred speech. Uh, he also reportedly failed three field sobriety tests. The real doozy comes to why. Well, when asked why he was out driving drunk, he blamed it on gay marriage. <clears throat> I felt a tremendous amount of pressure in my family. You know, you take those personal issues and betrayal on the professional side, and it gets really overwhelming. Which is what he was saying about about gay marriage, okay? Uh, or his or dealing with his his uh, fellow lawmakers who backed marriage equality. This is why he was out driving drunk. Um, gay marriage. Dwyer's recent drunk driving incident uh, includes some 15 charges, including driving under the influence, reckless and negligent driving, uh, being a nitwit and an a-hole. <laughs> Kanye West. I'm a monster size fan of hip-hop. Huge. A lot of you probably aren't and probably don't know that about me. Hi. You now learned something new about me. Uh, but And I'd say probably the two biggest rappers in the whole Probably, certainly the whole United States and possibly the whole world are Kanye West and Jay-Z. I don't care for either one of them. I just don't. Their music has never never gotten to me. I just, yeah. Anyway, Kanye West is working really, really hard to make me hate him more. Uh, this comes to us from thinkprogress.org. Uh, Kanye West has compared Kim Kardashian to the first lady. Oh, my. Goes on Twitter rants against comedians. Uh, and it seems that his latest stunt... Um, is to just get more attention, or maybe he's a d bag. Let's 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 go on. T-shirts and bags and hats for his Yeezus tour feature the Confederate flag. You heard that right. Long a symbol of rebellion and white supremacy in the South, West has decided to erase the flag's meaning and assign it his own. And I quote: "I took the Confederate flag and made it my flag. It's my flag. What are you gonna do now?" Unquote. According to West himself, he's a revolutionary leader, a number one rock star, a genius, but neither historian nor a student of current events seem to fit anywhere on that list. Of course, an artist is completely free to uh, divorce his work from politics, but the Confederate flag carries a history of American terror, violence, and rebellion with it. Simply making it his doesn't wash all that away. And he says... You know, the Confederate flag represented slavery. In a way, that's my abstract take on what I know about it, right? Yeah, Mr. West. Sure, fine. And his claim that it's super white boy approved is even more proof that he has no grasp on the flag's meaning. So, Sarah Palin was out there this week with her word salad, if I may. <laughs> uh, by the way, nothing... Okay, I'm just going to get into it. Our, I quote... Our free stuff is being paid for by taking money from our children and borrowing it from China. When that money becomes due, and this isn't racist, but it'll be like slavery when that note is due, we are going to be beholden to our foreign master. Here's a free tip. There's no phrase or sentence which is made 
which is made better by the inclusion of, <clears throat> this isn't racist, but, and I'm taking this from Hunter over at DailyCoast.com, okay, uh, it probably won't surprise you to learn that F- Palin uh, followed up her her deep thoughts on our future enslavement to the Chinese over our free stuff by not grousing against the fantastically expensive wars. Then she hawked her upcoming War on Christmas book because, of course she did. She went on with Matt Lauer to talk about the ACA. And I'm going to give you another direct quote. She's really hard to follow, but stick with me as best you can, okay? So Matt Lauer says, What are we hearing from the Tea Party in terms of an absolute realistic plan that can be an alternative to Obamacare? Okay, without thinking, here comes Sarah Palin. The plan is to allow those things that had been proposed over many years to reform a healthcare system in America that certainly does does need more help so that there's more competition there's less tort reform threat, there's less trajectory of the cost increases, and those have been proposed over and over again. These are actual words. I'm not messing this up. And what thwarts those plans? It's the far left. It's President Obama and his supporters who do not allow the Republicans to usher in the free market, patient-centered, doctor-patient relationship links to reform health care. Did you catch that? How is the ACA not the free market? It still includes private for-profit health insurance companies. Okay, And what plans is she talking about? Google it. There is no GOP health care plan. None. Let's get into Limbaugh. Limbaugh was, uh, well, trying to get the, the attention of the ladies this week. <clears throat> and I think it might have worked. Uh, quoting here uh, from... From the Rush Limbaugh show. Okay. Rush Limbaugh. Rush. But to... And they were talking about the Virginia governor's race. Which, by the way, uh, McAuliffe has already won. Uh, Right on. Get the cooch out of there. Rush. But to an unmarried single mother, a guy like McAuliffe may be exactly what she's calling for. The caller. It's quite possible. I was single for 14 years. I never had any children, but even in my brokest times, I never went to the government for my help. I always took care of myself, my family, and my friends helped me. Rush. The last thing that woman wants to hear is take care of yourself. The caller. I know. Then Rush goes on. That's scary. She's owed a living because life has dealt her so much unkindness. They saddled her with a kid. She's a single mother. Probably the husband walked out on her and she... Or she, or she kicked him out. Uh, something happened. But now she's owed something in her mind. And here comes McAuliffe identifying with her. McAuliffe said, Look, if you want to be a receptacle for male semen and not pay a price, then I'm your guy. You, you heard that right. Yeah, a semen receptacle. That's what he referred to the woman as. Just two days prior, he referred to Democratic women as abortion machines. Ah, oh, Rush. Rush and the ladies, oh my. Huh. So the the GOP has a lady problem, uh, and they've decided that they've got some plans, some things that they want to do about it, okay? Uh, three women in Virginia have started a consulting firm to help the Republican Party appeal to women voters. The women behind the firm, uh, two Mitt Romney 2012 campaign alums and a Republican poster, launched Burning Glass Consulting because they want... Uh, to, they want to get smarter about the way we communicate the Republican message specifically to women. Katie Packer Gage, a former deputy campaign manager for Romney, explained to the New York Times. Certainly there are challenges with other demographic groups, but women represent 53% of the electorate. But better messaging will do little to save a party from its core platform. Okay, The core platform of the GOP for years has been extreme positions on contraception, abortion, voting rights, and other issues that negatively impact and alienate single women voters. Those are the groups the burning glass would like to reach. Here's the thing. Ken Cuccinelli was just defeated on these kinds of things. Ladies, and by the way, I understand you're trying to help out the gentlemen to fool the ladies. Uh, ladies over there at Burning Glass, if you really, really, really want to reach women, okay, get out of their vaginas. I know I'm being a little crass here, but that's what you're doing. You're telling them what they can and cannot do with their own bodies. Okay, In Virginia, Bob McDonald made it law 
that if you wanted an abortion, you had to get a transvaginal ultrasound. You understand what that is? Whether you thought it was necessary, whether your doctor thought it was necessary, it didn't matter. A 10-inch wand, put up your hoo-hoo, and they, and to take pictures of the baby and make you look at the screen. Uh, it's hyperbole, certainly, to call it state-sanctioned rape, but I don't have a better phrase for it. By the way, Burning Glass, good, good luck with that. Uh, they're certainly not helping you in Texas. Uh, the 2014, uh, we had a, tw- we, well, the most recent elections, 2013 elections, uh, were a, dr- were a, apparently a dry run, obviously, for 2014. And there's clear evidence of disenfranchisement for women in Texas. Houston. For years, uh, this comes up from DailyCoast.com, Stephanie Cochran has voted without any problems, but when she went to the polls Tuesday in her upscale diverse neighborhood there, Things went a lot less smoothly thanks to the strict new voter ID law. On the voter roll, she's listed as Stephanie uh, Gallardo Cochran, while on her driver's license, she's Stephanie G. Cochran, a mismatch common to married or divorced women, including Wendy Davis, who's running for governor. Okay, As a result, Cochran faced what she described as a barrage of questions from poll workers about the discrepancy. In the end, Cochran was able to vote by signing an affidavit where she swore on penalty of perjury well, that she is who she claimed to be, but the experience left her angry. She told MSNBC that she sees the law as an attempt to keep women from the polls. It's against us, Cochran said. It's to keep us from voting for Wendy Davis. Okay. The Brendan study, updated as of 2012, pretty much forecast what happened, you know, the election night in Texas. Women were disproportionately affected because of the maiden name changes and divorce. Their male counterparts, by the way, had no problem voting in the booths. Okay. John Oldham, the elections administrator in Fort Bend County, estimated that at least 40% of early voters of his county signed affidavits. Who else does it target? Well, it targets the poor. Okay. The cost of birth certificates often required to ob- obtain state ID, and the IDs themselves can be a burden having to travel, maybe miss work, and that's another hurdle for them getting the ID. The poor. Okay. The seniors. The AARP says as many as one in five seniors lack a government-issued photo uh Government issued ID, okay? In 2006, as many as 8 million people over the age of 65 didn't have an identification, and the older they get, the less likely they are to go and get a driver's license. It's clear. It's clear who they're trying to keep away from the polls. People that might vote Democratic, or people that might vote at all, because they've learned that if you can't win it, you gotta steal it, okay? These are the top 10 moments of voter suppression. From 2012. We don't have one from this year yet, but when we get it, I'll, I'll cover it to you. But what's happening is not a mistake. They're trying to keep you from the polls. Every single one of you. Unless you're a white Christian male who will more than likely vote for a Republican. They've learned that if they can keep people away from the polls, they can win elections. Okay? Missouri tries to sell voter suppression as voter protection. Hoping to get a piece of the photo ID pie, Missouri legislators introduced a photo ID ballot initiative under the misleading name the Voter Protection Act. It included restrictions that could disenfranchise up to 250,000 Missouri voters. Ohio meddled with its wildly successful early voting period by saying that the uh, last three, you know, uh, voted away three days of early voting. Okay. Wisconsin and Ohio put up ominous billboards in communities of color. Dig this. In Washington and Ohio, billboards popped up in primarily African American neighborhoods depicting a gavel and ominously, ominously threatening voter fraud is a felony up to three and a half years and a $10,000 fine clearly designed to intimidate and confuse people of color away from voting. Okay. Voters in Ohio uh, were going to the right location, but poll workers sometimes directed them to the wrong table or provided the wrong ballot, making it legal to discard their ballot and disenfranchise thousands of black voters. Florida targeted soul to the polls. They said no more voting, no more early voting, and certainly no voting the Sunday before elections, which is when the black churches primarily would take their people to the polls to vote. Not to tell them who to vote for, but just take them to the polls to vote. And they there's no benefit to that other than to keep African Americans away from the polls. Florida took on the Boy Scouts and the League of Women Voters. A 2011 law placed onerous requirements and penalties 
on voter registration drives. All completed registration forms, for example, had to be submitted to election officials within 48 hours or face a fine of $1,000 per application. The law had its intended effects. Many groups, including the Boy Scouts and the legal women voters, shut down their voter registration in Florida as well. Ohio, no more convenient voting hours for anybody. Ohio Secretary of State John Husted decided to deny uh, expanded early voting hours in Democratic-leaning urban counties, only in Democratic-leaning counties, just as hours were solidly expanded in Republican areas. Pennsylvania's ID law. Florida, voter purge. Texas, more and more and more. And that's the point. Unions are democracy in the workplace. That's why they hate unions. There's no, there's no cases of people voting uh, fraudulently. And by the way, there are already insanely tough laws against people that vote uh, fraudulently. Okay, it's pretty rare. But from time to time, they lock a person up. And it's not that that's just the person that they caught. This brings me to my final thought. If you can't win it, steal it. Understand this, okay? The minimum wage, if I may real quick, has uh, the the refusal to raise the minimum wage has nothing to do with with protecting jobs or small businesses. It does, however, have everything to do with making sure the working class stays impoverished so that they remain politically impotent. When people were making fair wages after World War II and the middle class grew, people also became democratically involved. Think about the protests from our parents' times, the people in the streets, the people with the signs, the, 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 the naked people, fine, go, 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 uh, the protests against the war. People were out there, okay? And they were in the president's face and they were in their congressman's face, okay? They felt confident. They felt good. They were secure in their homes. They were secure in their jobs. They were secure in their finances and they became democratically involved. They got involved in their country. What's going on right now with the minimum wage? Uh, the Koch brothers recently held these parties that they, that they're calling Generation Opportunity, which is where they go, not, not they themselves, they send representatives, uh, Generation Opportunity to college campuses to throw these gigantic parties called Generation Opportunity. And they bring these kids in and they're trying to discourage them from, from, from signing up for Obamacare because part of what's going to make Obamacare work is having these young people sign up. Okay. Everybody pays. And when the older people get sick, it doesn't affect anybody. And then you eventually get there. You see the way this works? Okay. But they're going there with kegs of beer and they're getting these kids drunk and they're saying, hey, by the way, don't sign up for Obamacare. Your generation opportunity. You don't need to. The Koch brothers aren't really going to benefit from the fact that you don't have health care, except for the fact that if you're sick, you're broke or whatever else, you're less likely to get democratically involved. And that's the entire point. They're learning more and more that their voting base is shrinking. You can only win with white Christian males for so long. The Latino community is growing in America. Okay, Less and less people are buying what the Republican Party is selling. Their plan? Stop people from voting. Okay? All the gerrymandered districts, think about that. They don't care what you think. They don't want you to vote. And if you do vote, they want to draw the lines on the map very neatly so that they have these what they call safe districts where there's no way that a Democrat is ever going to win. The only thing they have to worry about is a primary challenger. They don't care what you think. They don't care what you want. As much as John Boehner likes to get on the mic on a regular basis and say, well, 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 well what the American people want, well... Actually, what the American people want is not you, Boehner. Congress is at a 9% approval rating. For all of your bellowing about what the American people want, it's becoming pretty clear that they don't want you. We need, at the very least, two viable political parties in this country so that we have a clear choice. We can make a choice. We don't like guy one, we can go with guy two. 
At least two. I know there's splinter parties, but they don't get to put up serious candidates. If we have a choice, then I don't just get my ballot and vote straight Democratic. I find out about everybody, and I vote a nice, even amount. But what I have right now, when my ballot comes in the mail, is voting for nutbag or not so bad. And that's not much of a choice. We need two viable parties. The Republican Party is going to have to purge the racist. They're going to have to purge the Klan. They're going to have to purge the Tea Partiers. And they're going to have to stop relying on hatred as their message. Hatred and keeping people broke, rooting for people to stay sick, and trying to keep people poor, that message needs to go away and die. Now, the Republicans might try to win a few more elections with that inspiring message, but this fella right here on this microphone says that that is not going to last very long, and we're going to clean house in 2014. It'd be a good idea to also get money out of politics. If you can't win it, Steal it. Nah. I think it's just time we get rid of all of you. It's pretty clear you don't like democracy. And now it's time for you to go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me for the Fire You Can Put Out, episode number 43. A uh, big shout out to uh, my host and co- uh, former co host and my producer Kevin and, and all the rest. And certainly thank you for listening. I will bring you another fiery episode next week where I'm sure we'll cover someone getting shot. Sure, we'll cover Obamacare a little bit more. Thank you for your continued support. We are the fire you can't put out. And we will prevail. Good day.